Whether you like it or not, the boost formula defined and is still defining an entire era of Sonic. We've seen several attempts at it, some obviously better than others, but I hardly ever see people talk about the one that started it all. Today, ladies and gentlemen, we'll be discussing a game that's far from two-dimensional despite its focus on 2D gameplay. And most importantly, unlike the game that came out soon after it, this was in no way a rush job. Hello everybody, I'm Garilla64, and I don't apologize for any bad puns ever, and neither should you. Sonic Rush is a strange game for me because it's something I'm really familiar with now, but it's not because I have a lot of nostalgia for it. I did actually own this game back in 2005 on my original DS, but I kinda hated it because, I mean, one thing that stayed constant throughout my entire life is that I am not very good at video games. I remembered frustration and then ambivalence in that order before I sold the game off, never to think about it again. At least that's what I thought then, because I didn't realize years into the future I'd be running a Sonic-centric YouTube channel. But don't get me wrong, I do do a lot of things, including stuff on Twitch, which you can follow if you want to see me stream. Released in 2005, Sonic Rush was the very first Sonic game to ever appear on the Nintendo DS. Much like its advanced siblings before it, the game was made by Dimps and Sonic Team together. Man, what a dream team. Until later on, of course, but we're not here to talk about that yet. This game once again takes Sonic back to his 2D roots, but this time his roots have been injected with gamer fuel and the boy is faster than ever before. Holding down the Y button gives Sonic a burst of speed and immunity to enemies that might cross his path. We would eventually come to know this as the boost, and it hasn't really changed too much since then aside from adding some airborne action later on. Sonic also has the ability to homing attack and air dash by pressing the R button, which is an essential skill for keeping your speed up during gameplay. The R button also allows you to do these special jumps off ramps and springs like in Sonic Advance 2, but that's not all you can do with ramps and springs. Sonic Rush? More like... Son Trick Rush? Your threats don't scare me. So tricks are basically the name of the game if my stupid pun has anything to say about it. If you mash the B button and control pad like you're a speedrunner sitting through the same dialogue for the 4,000th time, Sonic will just style on him. This aside from raking in the points, fills up your boost meter and makes the game, and this is totally accurate, I promise you, a rush. The amount of footage I have of me just doing tricks like this is obnoxious. It probably drove my editor crazy. Yeah, cool, all right, yeah, okay, yeah, cool, I got, yeah, all right, yeah, cool, okay, yeah, yeah, ow. Rush starts off by immediately throwing you into the action. This was so abrupt that I actually went to check online to make sure my game wasn't bugging out or something. But this is something that we'd see again in Sonic Colors a few years down the road, and I like it, honestly. As Sonic, you blaze through Leaf Storm, and then you're at the first boss already. Eggman's in this big ol' snake thing, and it has two different insta-kill attacks for some reason. That's a big no-no in my book. After taking care of him, though, he flies off, leaving Mysterious Jewel behind. But before Sonic can pilfer it for himself, a cyclone of fire erupts from the ground. Standing before him is a brand new character, and one that many will end up calling their favorite someday. Blaze takes the emerald and hightails it out of there, and Sonic just lets it happen. He does not do a lot in this game, honestly. But jeez, Blaze, why does Sega let you have two emeralds? Maybe I should go get some of my own. After all, that one doesn't look chaotic enough for me. The Chaos Emeralds are back for this game, and I'm gonna drop my first of a couple hot takes for this video. I believe this game has the best special stages and special stage entrances in the entire series. When you're boosting through the levels, you might come across something that looks a little bit like one of those rotating things from Sonic Advance 2. If you grab it, it doesn't do anything. But if you happen to hold down the Y button with at least one full boost bar, Sonic tears a hole right in the space-time continuum and enters a special stage. Alright, so you know how this is on the DS? Well, one of the major selling points of the console was touch controls, so you know they had to force it in somewhere. Now, before you groan and bellyache about it, if this controlled normally, it would be worse off. The game gives you time to get your stylus ready, and once you're all set, you enter a familiar halfpipe, but this time you control Sonic by poking the touchscreen where you want him to go. Sure, that might sound terrible, but it's actually one of the most responsive uses of the DS's touchscreen that I have ever experienced. Aside from that, all you're doing is collecting rings, dodging mines, and doing some sick tricks by touching these number pop-ups in order. These things range from really easy to pretty dang difficult, but the best part about it is, unlike the games that came before it, you can try these over and over again as long as you've got enough boost energy to re-enter the stage. You can even take a quick walk, build it back up, and then go for it again. The game does limit your ability to fill the meter if you use the same source to do it more than once, so this ends up being a very fair and balanced set of special stages that have not been topped to this day. Next up, Sonic goes to Water Palace, where, you guessed it, there's a lot of water. But it's not one of those bad water levels. I mean, heck, it was good enough to be brought back in Generation 3DS, and the music. I 
I know I haven't mentioned it yet, but Hideki Naganuma knocks it so far out of the park that it loops around the Earth, and then he knocks it out of the park again. If I could only listen to one OST for the rest of my life, this would be very, very high on the list, if not my number one choice. The Egg Plesiosaur is next, and I can't stop thinking about Plesiosaur from Mega Man Star Force 2. I got hit by a lot of stuff in this fight, but it wasn't hard per se. You're also underwater the entire time, but I didn't hear the drowning music even once, since you get to breathe after every single hit. It's at this point we learn that Dr. Eggman isn't really Dr. Eggman. He's Dr. Eggman with different clothes, or as the game calls him, Dr. Eggman Nega. Who is he? I don't know. He's from another dimension. Or the future. Or something. Maybe we'll find out later and say I'll just wreck on it. I mean, it's not like it's really important, right? Mirage Road now takes the stage, and it brings with it one of my least favorite things about this game. Forced combat. Among the many things that I will never forgive Sonic Heroes for, forced combat is at the top of the list, because it has infected so many of the other games at this point. It makes even less sense in this game, because all you end up doing is pressing the Y button to clear the room, waiting, then pressing it again when more enemies fall. It adds nothing to the game, and it really doesn't need to be here. There's also two auto-scrolling segments in the zone where you ride this lift, and it can get pretty annoying since they go on for way too long. But the second one randomly flips the game into a beat-em-up looking thing with 3D movement? It's cool, I guess? I just really don't like auto-scrolling levels, especially in Sonic games, because you're supposed to be rewarded by going fast for doing well, but this just stops you in your tracks regardless of how well you're doing. Now, Eggman was always a stinker and never knew how to bug off, so he took his strengths and combined them into one. The Stink Bug boss rolls a giant explosive at you, and you just need to hit it back when he turns around. Sonic then watches as Eggman Nega escapes again, not bothering to stop him. On the way to Carnival Casino Night Park Zone, Vanilla tells Sonic that Cream ran off with some person wearing purple, and they decide that that must be the girl from before, because no one in the main cast wears purple, and no one ever changes their clothes. Night Carnival rocks a familiar, flashy, and colorful aesthetic that even calls back to Carnival Night by having some electricity-based gimmicks where you need to enable the power to use certain rails or pathways. Man, who would have expected that Night Carnival would have throwbacks to Carnival Night? That's honestly so out of left field. This stage is where it starts to become obvious that the people that made Sonic Advance 2 made this game. There are bottomless pits everywhere in this game, and sometimes there's no way to recover from even a tiny mistake like letting go of one of these swinging things too early. I got stuck here and had no choice but to die because they just don't reset. Just saying, they probably could have had a pathway down here that leads back up to the top area, punishing the player by making them take more time to correct their mistake, but no, you pushed the jump button too soon. Your sentence is death. Third boss is some kind of carnival ride, you hit the non-egg side when it blows a fuse, and then you deal damage when Eggman Nega is lowered. After you hit him though, he'll drop this little friend that launches you into the air high enough to hit Eggman again, so this fight goes by really quick. You've probably noticed at this point that I haven't been boosting during boss fights, and that's because you can't. I usually don't like it when devs change up how a game plays for a big part of the game like this. For example, I didn't like Sonic Advance 2's boss fights because they did just that. But I didn't really miss the boost in these fights because the bosses are slow and the arena is small. Boosting would have just gotten me killed more often than would have helped. Sonic and Tails then come across a huge rock and someone whose head is filled with rocks, who informs them that a feline with an attitude recently beat him up. Yep, that's my life alright. The duo then enters what might be some kind of gun battleship since all the enemies are sprite recreations of the robots from SA2. This one's a lot more enclosed than the others and has a ton of enemy rooms, not to mention there are two parts where if you're running through the stage like any normal person would be, they crush you to death out of nowhere. It happens once in the first act and once in the second, and it feels like a really lazy way to hamper the player's progress. Thankfully, if you get a game over, you don't need to get the Chaos Emerald for that stage again, but you will have to do both acts over unless you've already made it to the boss. Speaking of that, it's boss one again, except this time he realized he could beat me by boring me to death while I wait for him to be done with his dumb missile attack. Sonic and Tails finally find Blazing Cream, and Sonic can't go five seconds without forcing his FRIENDSHIP IS THE ULTIMATE POWER thing on this person he's never met before. Blazing Cream get beamed up, and thus begins, I feel like, the most irritating level, but it's only slightly worse than Huge Crisis. Altitude Limit is one giant bottomless pit, but I didn't find myself falling into it as often as the previous levels. It has this gimmick where you pilot these jet platforms upwards through enemies or occasionally Flappy Bird obstacle courses, and I remember them being a lot harder than they were. Then again, the last time I played this I was streaming, so the streamer's curse was in full effect. Boy. Boy. Did you really just go on and do that? Possibly calling back to Sonic 2 Game Gear, they also have these 3D paragliding sections. As usual, they overstay their welcome, but the second one at least feels quick enough to be fun. Boss 6 is another tedious affair. You gotta wait for him to try and jump on you or rush at you before you can hit him, and his other attacks take forever. He also has another insta-kill move, but if you know how to press A and B, you are not in any real danger. In my notes for this part, I just have Cat Girl Blaze makes Amy upsetty, and I don't remember if I had another joke planned for this, so I'm just gonna leave it at that. 
Deadline is all about gravity, rockets, and anxiety. Every time I was on one of these rockets, I forgot which direction did what, and I was always expecting to die, but to my astonishment, they only kill you with one of these one time, and it's at the very end of the stage. It's actually really good level design, because they teach you how to use it for a long time before they kill you with it. And even when you die, there's a checkpoint right before it, so honestly, it's not even something to complain about. The boss, however, is not Eggman this time. Instead, Blaze gets really upset at herself that Sonic is trying to help her, and she decides to assault him because who wouldn't want to assault this face? Blaze surprisingly breaks the tradition of character battles in this series being pathetically easy. It fakes you out at first, making you think it's gonna be easy, and then it actually provides a little challenge, followed by a really iconic moment where Sonic and Blaze have a good old Dragon Ball Z struggle before Sonic emerges victorious, and then he worries more about Eggman getting away than how he just threw Blaze into the cold vacuum of space. After Cream and Tails arrive, Sonic delivers what I can only assume to be something he read in two different fortune cookies, and that's enough for Blaze to begin to trust him. Who needs good writing? I don't. Since Blaze is in no shape to fight, Sonic heads off to fight the final boss, and this robot is massive. You deal damage to it by avoiding its attacks, striking its arm, and then climbing it Shadow of the Colossus style to hit the cockpit. This gets progressively harder and its attacks become more and more savage over time, but this boss fight is really fun and really, really fair. I don't know what it is about this specific game, they just got a lot of stuff right. Like, some of these attacks take forever to dodge, but afterwards they don't make you wait to hit him again, he gives you a chance every single time. By the end of it, I was holding on for dear life with zero rings, and I just managed to land the final hit, and it was so satisfying. And that's Sonic's story. It ends off with some nice art along the lines of what we saw in the Sonic Advance 2 cutscenes, and then it ends, and you're supposed to play the entire game again as Blaze. You do unlock her right after you beat the first boss, but personally playing them back to back is probably a better option than switching back and forth. Blaze and Sonic explore the exact same levels, but control slightly differently. It's almost not enough to notice, but I believe Blaze is a tiny bit slower than Sonic, and instead of a homing attack, she has a hover move if you hold down the R button. Her extra jumps when pressing the R button are also way stronger than Sonic's, so she can pull off more tricks in the air, and also allows her to reach new alternate pathways that Sonic couldn't reach. For example, there's that area where I got tripped up in Night Carnival before. See? It's a thing of the past. Overall, I think I had less fun playing as Blaze, though, because of these changes they made to her playstyle, and I never really got used to how she handled. Also, it didn't help that I was searching high and low for the emerald portals in the first level before realizing you just get the soul emeralds from beating bosses. Yeah, Blaze doesn't just stand there like Sonic does when he wins. She busts this guy up to get her stuff back. Her story really isn't anything special either, it's basically Cream not understanding the whole stranger danger thing for a while until Blaze and her form a friendship. The only major change in her story is that of course she fights Sonic instead of herself, and Sonic is out for blood. Do you have any idea how impossible it is to create a tornado in space, yet he does it anyway because he's that serious about beating Blaze? But once you finish that up, you fight the final boss again, and then last story unlocks. It's revealed that the two Eggmen have been trying to acquire both sets of shiny rocks to do bad things. Shocker. Thanks to that, Sonic and Blaze's dimensions are colliding, and this will bring about the destruction of everything. Sonic teaches Blaze how to use the Soul Emeralds properly, and then the two transform for one final attack on their foes. It starts off looking a lot like Doomsday Zone, and then it just turns into every other supersonic fight for the most part. Wait for Eggman to throw some stuff at you, and then hit it back. After a couple hits, the game switches you to Blaze, who takes on Eggman Nega, but instead of ramming into projectiles, she makes her own projectiles by hitting the A button. Of the two playstyles, I think Blaze offers a much more unique and fun experience, but you end up playing as Sonic more often during this fight, and it gets really chaotic and stressful, but it's not bad. Sonic and Blaze team up for one final attack, and that's game. Before being separated, the two recreate the ending of the Jimmy Timmy Power Hour and vow they'll see each other again. And see each other again they shall in the sequel. I love this game. And I'm willing to stake my entire reputation on that, and that's big because I don't even like steak. I think this is one of the best 2D Sonic games that has ever come out. It has ridiculously fun gameplay, introduces a fan-favorite character who become muddled in confusion thanks to the gem released in 2006 we all know about, but regardless of that, this game also paved the way for not only three sequels, but also an entire new era of modern Sonic that I hold in very high regard. Mostly. You know how they say too much of a good thing can be bad? Well... This isn't one of those things. Hello everybody, I'm Garrulous64, and Sonic Rush Adventure isn't bad, but it's also not amazing. I don't know what the general consensus on this one is, since I hear even less people talk about this game than the original Rush, but what could possibly be wrong with more of this? 
If you joined me for the Sonic Rush review, pro tip, it's in the card right up there if you didn't, you'll remember that I praised the hell out of this game. It just showed up back in 2005 and created an entirely new gameplay style for the series, and we're still using that gameplay style today, albeit at the cost of removing 90% of the charm from it, but, you know, it's just a direct downgrade, it's alright, whatever, I don't care. Point is, when you have something that works, it's only natural to start thinking about a sequel, and in 2007, we finally got one. I just want to bring on the applause for how nice all the 3D cutscenes are in this game. They run at a great frame rate, and the added bonus of having this over this really makes you feel like you're actually gearing up for a new venture. La la. Yeah, I know, it's the title theme, it's a funny joke, alright, keep going. Being a direct sequel, Sonic Rush Adventure doesn't change up the formula that much. You're once again playing as Sonic and Blaze, and they boost homing attack and hover through a ton of new stages that range from okay to great, let me tell you. And of course, who could forget the tricking mechanic? That is thankfully back again. And much to my delight, you can not only trick off more things than ever before, but you can also activate the legendary Omega Trick! Yeah, honestly, at this point, you can hardly even hear the music because the sound effects get so loud. I don't know if that was the best design choice. I, I kind of wish you could turn them down in the options menu or something, but that's neither here nor there, I guess. And thankfully, you can just look the songs up on YouTube, of course, and just mute the game, and I actually ended up doing this a bit here and there so I could actually give an opinion on the game soundtrack, which... Unfortunately, that's where my criticisms of the game begin. I'll give it that this game soundtrack is a lot more varied than Rush's, but honestly, not as many of the songs really got my blood pumping like the original game's OST did. That's not to say that there aren't some straight-up bangers in this game, but not as many that I can call out by name, that's for sure. Now, no adventure would be complete without a story, and a story this game has... Oh boy, does it have a story, with characters, and a plot. If my awkward tone of voice isn't really filling you in on what this is getting at, it's not really anything special. It's basically just big bad guys doing something bad, go stop him, but we also have some admittedly very nice character moments, which pretty much makes it up for me. Like, where things are very basic in terms of plot and how it progresses, the characters themselves and their interactions are really well written, and I really enjoy them. But unfortunately, that comes to the cost of having to bear witness to one of the worst things to ever happen to this franchise. Much like in the first Rush title, this game introduces a new character to the series. But we'll get to that in a second. Kicking things off, Sonic and Tails are flying the tornado when they decide to reenact the Titanic, except in a way cooler fashion. The duo then wakes up, stranded on some beach that they don't recognize, and the plane is toast! And even worse than that, there's sand everywhere and they'll never get it out of their socks. But I'd gladly take sand covering everything I own for the rest of my life if I could prevent that fateful meeting that occurs shortly after this. An unnamed orange menace appears from the depths of hell to greet our heroes, and Sonic immediately has the correct reaction to the situation. Call it a premonition, I suppose. This is Marine the Raccoon, the new main character that I alluded to before, and if it wasn't obvious, I don't like her. Like at all. I have a tiny bit in my notes about it, and apparently she was able to exist in front of me for seven minutes before I got sick of her, and when I say someone is worse than Charmy, yeah, that's a huge problem considering Marine isn't in half as many games as him. One day passes, and Sonic and Tails have had enough, so they decide to craft a nifty little water bike. But, you know, Tails for some reason built enough space on the thing for three people, so Marine tags along anyway. Right here, we're introduced to another of this game's main gimmicks. Dimps and Sonic Team saw Legend of Zelda Phantom Hourglass and must have thought it was pretty cool. The result of that is that they decided to add several sailing minigames instead of just letting us go from stage to stage the easy way. Some might like this, some might not. I can see both sides, since things like the jet ski are pretty fun, but as the game goes on and you have to rely on the less exciting vehicles, that's where my interest drops off. Much like Phantom Hourglass, from your starting position, you plot a course and then sail to your chosen destination. But unlike Phantom Hourglass, you don't get confirmation that you'll actually land where you want to land before you set off. This means that if you're even a pixel out of range of the island or event that you're traveling to, Tails will just go, Oh, whoopsie daisy guys, there's no land to land on here, let's go back to the island, instead of just pressing on for like two more seconds and reaching the destination. Your expedition can also be put on halt if your path is obscured by a landmass you didn't intend to draw through, but thankfully they thought ahead and made it so you could reroute from that point if you still have fuel to spare. Really, all of this could have been avoided if they just let you know whether you'd end up where you're trying to go before you start the minigame, thus cutting down as much time using this dumb, stupid, boring boat as possible. There are four different minigame playstyles in this game. The jet ski, which controls almost identically to the special stages from the first rush, i.e. really well. The boat, which if you couldn't tell by my previous comment, is dumb and stupid. Tails pilots the thing at a snail's pace and you just fire at enemies and it's just stupid, it's, it's dumb, I hate it. 
We also have the hovercraft and the submarine. The hovercraft is actually fairly entertaining, but it amounts to just mashing L and R to spin and firing blasts to clear mines occasionally. And the submarine is almost a rhythm game, but not really. It's kind of the best way to travel by the end of the game, since it goes a lot quicker than the other things and it has a very good range. But my preferred way would have been the jet ski, since like I said, it's actually fun, which is usually the reason I play video games. Upon reaching the island, the gang finds a ton of mushrooms, and Marine says she's gonna eat one, and I'm all for it. Heck, might solve one of the game's biggest problems so far. Jeez. This day just keeps getting worse. The first stage in the game, aside from the tutorial, is Plant Kingdom, a stage full of huge mushrooms, trees that give me sad D&D flashbacks, but that's a story for another time, and of course plenty of places to get your trick on, including the new level intro, where every stage you have the opportunity to get some tricks in and fill your boost meter by jumping off the starting platform. It's here that I also discovered a nice little easter egg in the form of Sonic's various animations. If you were to hold right and press R when jumping off a spring or any other stage element with spring-like properties, Sonic's windmill kick from Sonic Advance 2 makes a comeback. And that's not all, something I praise Dimps for in that game as well, the unique bouncing animations from Music Plant are also featured in this game when Sonic bounces off the giant mushrooms. And here's a small fun fact about that, Red Hot Sonic told me that they're a reference to Rystar, a game that I still really want to play but haven't gotten around to yet. Not sure where these sprites appear, but man, in a game where I have a handful of complaints in terms of gameplay, little things like this really brighten up the mood a little bit. Sonic then notices that he's somehow stumbled onto Jurassic Park, and squares off with a giant robot T-Rex, which is incredibly easy to destroy, but long neck mode really saves the entire thing. Look at him, he's so tall, I have no choice but to respect him. Sonic returns to the group after casually putting that T-Rex back in the ground, and says nothing about it to anyone. I don't know if it's a random moment of bad writing, or if Sonic just really didn't think it was a big deal. Marine and her crew then take a trip to an island made entirely of metal, and they find a ton of robots just chilling out, and Sonic slaughters all of them because all he knows is war. Machine Labyrinth looks really confusing at first, but after replaying it a ton, I can say that the levels in Sonic Rush Adventure are a lot easier than the ones in Rush, and they don't attempt to kill you with the new player traps quite as much. Boss 2 is a huge pendulum, and while I think it's a fun idea, hitting its variously sized balls back and forth is only entertaining for so long. Yep, I really wrote that in the script, I guess. At this point, the game reveals two new tidbits for you. One great, and one really, really bad. If you haven't been paying attention up to this point, every time you finish a level, you receive materials, and you get more of each depending on your ranking. The purpose of these is to pad out the game's length, almost a full two hours more than the original. You see, you need to build all your vehicles, which means you need to collect enough materials to do so. If you don't have enough, guess what you gotta do? If you guess turn off the game and do something else, that's a valid idea, but it won't help you build the sea Beyblade, now will it? What you need to do is replay the levels over and over until you're able to build what you need. While I do like the gameplay, there was one point in my playthrough where I just had to play the final act of the final level four times in a row so that I could finish the game, and at that point makes washing the dishes that have been piling up in my sink look more fun than continuing to play this. Once the boat is built, the crew and marine set off towards another island, and thankfully you're able to set sail from any major location you found on the map, which is the good tidbit I brought up a second ago. Thankfully they had enough common sense to let you do that, or else I probably wouldn't have finished this thing. On the way, we run into a cocky green character that asserts that he's faster than Sonic could ever be on his chosen form of transportation, and challenges us to a race. Sorry Johnny, we already have someone who fits that description back home, we're gonna have to vote you off the island. This scripted event is how you come across the special stages of this game for the first time. Using the jet ski, thankfully, you race Johnny as he does what Sonic NPCs do best and repeats the same three voice lines over and over until you whoop him and take the Chaos Emerald for yourself. Also, no one reacts to the fact that you just randomly found a Chaos Emerald, which I find weird, but regardless, you better get ready to bring your A-game on these things because they get hard. Like, so hard that you can't beat them. Like, literally, you cannot finish some of them until you upgrade your jet ski, and you know what that means! <laughs> And it gets worse because you also can't just choose to upgrade the vehicle you want, you need to upgrade them in the order you got them, which means you need to upgrade everything once before you can get the second bike upgrade. You could have just dropped a menu in there? Pick which one you want to upgrade? I don't know, there's a lot of tediousness in this game that could have been avoided. I just don't like the system at all. I, I feel like if they wanted to lock these races behind upgrades, Johnny should have said something like, You think he could beat me with that thing? As if, and then rejected your race. Just be upfront about it instead of having him rubber band on you right at the end of a race just because you don't have the upgrade you needed. The only saving grace to these Johnny races is that his location isn't randomized on the map every time you play. All you need to do is wander into his neck of the... woods to challenge him. Your first time through, you could use a guide, or if you like aimlessly boating around, be my guest. 
As the story continues to progress, the gang discovers a cave, and this is where things really get rolling. Coral Caves is a beautiful submerged cavern that apparently holds something incredible. That being Blaze the Cat. She's here. Hooray. But that's kind of weird, because she went back to her own dimension last game. We're in Blaze's dimension? Man, Sonic and Tails ain't in Kansas no more. <laughs> That could be catastrophically bad, considering the Chaos Emeralds are here, too. Remember all that stuff about imbalances from the first game? Yeah, me neither. Let's pretend that's not real. The cave also hides a new villain that's looking for a powerful artifact, and he doesn't look like anyone we've ever seen in the Sonic series before. He's totally working alone. Sonic and Blaze take down the Ghost Kraken, another battle that submerges you in water, but like the Egg Turtle in the first game, they're very lenient with the drowning, so don't stress out over it. From this point on, the game falls back on the whole, hey, there's an island over there, so maybe we should check it out thing, and then you either go there, or you go build a new vehicle to reach it. Blaze is available from this point on to play in whatever level you want, whether it be a main course or a side level, of which there are several, and some even reference the original Sonic Rush, borrowing gimmicks from them, or even recreating the entirety of Leaf Storm Act 1. A couple of these hidden islands also have this weird cutscene at the end that shows the gang finding something and then just walking away. Maybe just remember that for later. Around this time is when the Soul Emerald missions start popping up as well. Unlike the last game, you need to collect both sets of emeralds, which I am all for, but the way they did this confuses the heck out of me. At first, this koala here will tell you that he's located one of the emeralds and that Blaze should go get it or whatever, and you gotta talk to Marine to start the mission. Maybe it's best if you just let him be lost, because I don't really want to talk to her. These missions start out as being rematches against the bosses, except this time you play as Blaze. So you might be thinking, you just refight all the bosses, right? That's how I remembered it. But no, they decided to make it complicated and stupid. Some of the Soul Emeralds are found after refighting bosses, but the others are found by exploring hidden islands. That doesn't sound so bad, right? Well, it gets better, just wait. You find an island, complete it, and then you get a message saying you unlocked a new mission. You go to the Marine, but she doesn't have the Soul Emerald mission. So you go talk to the Koala, and he unlocks the mission for you, so you can select it from Marine's menu, and then you play the same level again, except it's slightly different, or maybe not at all, because I didn't even notice. And the best part is, I played one of these with Blaze the first time through, and they just made me do it a second time? Like, okay, whatever, guys. I would have been totally fine just refighting bosses, but, you know, who doesn't love confusing nonsense and wasting time? Oh, most people? That's kind of weird. Maybe Dimps thought the opposite. And that, I think, is the last dumb thing I need to talk about regarding this game. From here on out, it's all smooth sailing. If you can call this smooth. The Haunted Ship houses some cannons that shoot you through the air, and some weird chess gimmick that's really not fun, but the music is a bop, so I'm all for it. Also, I refer to this stage as Pirate Storm the entire time I talked about it in my notes, because apparently I was thinking about Secret Rings, and I guess it's also because Haunted Ship is a really boring name. This is also the only place in the game where having a boss be called the Ghost Anything makes sense. Speaking of which, the Ghost Pirate feels like something right out of Peter Pan. You duel a pirate robot on both the deck and the mast of a ship, and it is super fun. I play Blizzard Peaks next, I think you have the option of choosing between it and Sky Babylon, or at least that's how the game frames it. Kind of a nice switch up, as you have to go through every other level in a predetermined order. There are more callbacks in this level, including a snowboarding section that harkens back to Sonic 3 and Knuckles, except they do way more with it and it actually gets sorta of hard when they bring it back for one of the secret levels. The boss fight of this one's actually really unique too. They call it the Ghost Whale, despite the fact that it's obviously a robot, and you run around in the thing's insides to get to the weak point before the timer runs out, and it feels almost like Race to the Finish from Smash Bros. Sky Babylon is a level that takes place in the sky. 20 points to whoever was able to figure that one out. Since Babylon is in the name, I have to again mention the comparison between Johnny and Jet. This definitely wasn't a coincidence, and I'm pretty sure Sky Babylon is Blaze's version of Angel Island and Babylon Gardens put together. Also, hot take maybe, and no pun intended since it's about Blaze, but Blaze is just the Soul Dimension counterpart of Sonic. Like, I'm not the only one who thinks this, right? Like, they wear practically the same shoes, they have very similar powers, they both fight an Eggman. I'm not gonna budge on this, fight me. Sky Babylon was probably my favorite level, I think. The platforming felt really great, and I really spiced my way through the entire thing, and when I finished it, my heart and brain just felt really good. The boss for this one takes place in a three-dimensional space as you wait for it to attack, and then when it does, you get thrown onto the top screen to launch a counterattack. Feels awkward for a bit, but once you get used to it, it's really imaginative and entertaining, and plus, even though the gameplay style looks like it changes drastically, it doesn't actually play very different from what you're used to. Once you've taken care of the Ghost Condor, the team finds their way to Pirate's Island, again, a very creative name, but they aren't able to enter it thanks to a snazzy puzzle lock. Captain 
Captain Whisker ingeniously tells the gang that they need to go find clues to rotate the pieces in a certain way, and this is actually the last negative thing I have about the game for real this time. Remember those seemingly meaningless Hidden Island cutscenes? Well, you gotta go play those levels again now that you know that you're looking for clues. Sure, the levels aren't that long, but I don't really see any reason why Tails couldn't have just gone, Hey, this looks important. Maybe we should take a note of this symbol. But after everything we've seen with this game so far, I guess convenience wasn't really the first thing on Dimp's mind when they made this. Once you've gone back and gotten all those, quite possibly my favorite section of the story takes place. The gang is about to shove off for Pirate's Island again when they decide that enough is enough and they kick Marine off the squad. Not exactly kicking her off the moving boat like I would have done, but this is probably just as painful to her as that. Blaze is literally my hero. Pirate's Island reminds me of Water Palace from the first game because of its bright visuals and architectural design. There are some catapults here that launch cannonballs to break pathways open for you, and you'll also be aided by some friendly dolphins from time to time, which in true Sonic Rush fashion will get you killed at some point if you're not careful, but thankfully they're not as annoying to pilot as the rockets from Deadline. And finally, after 400 million hours of sailing, the gang closes in on Captain Whisker and Johnny, who just decided he's a villain, not a rival. I love team-up fights like this, but watching this play out is embarrassing for them. Johnny and Whisker desperately jump around trying their best to send me to Davy Jones, according to the captain, but no matter what they do, the buzzsaws that show up halfway through the fight are the real boss. This dope actually tries throwing Johnny at you every so often, and he ricochets around the arena like a torpedo, and while that's awesome, it's hardly effective, and you trash them all the same. Johnny dips, favoring self-preservation over his mission, and Whisker seems worried that someone's gonna be mad at them for losing to Sonic and Blaze. Gosh, I wonder who that could be! There's some weird bit next with Whisker threatening to tickle Marine or something, I don't want anything to do with this, but then apparently behind this boring text conversation, Marine is being attacked by this thing! Ain't that swell. Or big swell, rather. Here's our end of story, boss, folks. This giant thing really radiates Bomber Barbera energy, except this fight overall is a lot less intense. You're primarily trying to get the bot to target the shield, protecting the cannons on either side of the arena so they shatter. Then you'll be able to launch yourself at the boss to land a few hits. It may not be as challenging as the last game's fight, but it's still a nice cap to the adventure. And make sure you're listening closely to the battle theme, because you can actually hear a little bit of Wrapped in Black in there. God, I live for these little references. Sonic and Blaze take out the trash and look amazing doing it, and that's when the credits roll. No conclusion to the story or anything, that's just it. Well, they also do drop a little teaser for something we already expected since we first saw Whisker, but let's pretend to be surprised for Dimp's sake. Once you're thrown back into the game, you're allowed to start upgrading your vehicles to procure the rest of the emeralds, and that's when disaster strikes. Someone's stolen the Jeweled Scepter and is causing a slew of natural disasters! Oh man, dude, bro, it's those egotistical Eggman twins, bro, that's so crazy, I can't believe they're in this game! With the Scepter, they pretend they're stronger than both sets of emeralds, and then they take off towards the center of the Earth to make sure they're strong enough to build an amusement park. And that is just such a lame ambition to have when you're holding the power of literal gods in your hands. I mean, heck, cure all disease in the world, stop the ice caps from melting, get Dash Pass for free for DoorDash, it's great, I mean, you could do that. Sonic and Blaze give chase, have more character moments that make me really admire the writers, and then we bear witness to what could have been the coolest super transformation in the series if it was just a little bit longer. I just loved seeing all 14 of the emeralds swirling around Sonic and Blaze, it's such a cool visual. Finally, final battle time! It's the Egg Wizard! As someone who plays strictly magic-based classes in D&D, I can get behind this. Super Sonic for once doesn't spend his time ramming into projectiles, since this time he's got a reflect move that sends attacks flying back at the boss. Burning Blaze comes equipped with her fireball attack yet again, and like the previous game, she is a lot more fun to play as than Super Sonic. And thanks to the fact that you don't need to switch between them at all, there's not really a reason to. If you don't want to, you can just stick with her for the entire three-phase fight. Have a ball. A fireball. The only oddity here is that they recycled Blaze's voice clip from the last game's final fight, so whenever you switch to her, she just screams, I know! And it's like, what do you know that I don't? I, I really, I would love to know. This boss fight is leagues better than Rush's, and in fact, it might be my favorite super battle in the entire series. It feels really hectic with all the projectiles being launched at you, and it's thrilling to switch to Super Sonic for a couple seconds just to bat some fire dragons away before letting Burning Blaze get back to doing her thing. You'll totally see what I mean if you give this game a look. The docks eventually find themselves at the end of the rope, big surprise, when Eggman Nega gets the bright idea to charge up a blast that could just destroy the entire planet, Frieza-style. 
Marine does whatever this is, seriously, to be ever established that she has laser hands, because I'm a little bit worried about the trash talking I've been doing if she can interrupt this supposed all-powerful entity with one tiny blast. Then the rest of this encounter goes the same as every other song and dance in the series, and it's finally time for Sonic and Tails to head home using the dimensional travel machine that Tails just casually whips up. He's a smart boy. Straight A's. Good job. Very proud. Blaze initiates the handshake with Sonic this time around, and then the duo speeds off into the sunset as Blaze pushes Marine off the dock, ending Sonic Rush Adventure for real this time. What a happy ending for all parties involved. I have some conflicting feelings about this game, since while I was playing it I had a lot of complaints, which my editor Andrew can attest to, but upon stewing on it for a few weeks and reading back my notes, I feel like I had a great time playing this game, and the ending got me feeling some kind of emotion and everything. I just really love the dynamic between Sonic and Blaze above all else in this game, like if it wasn't obvious, and it's a shame that they haven't explored it again this in-depth to this day. I'm just gonna end this off by saying that if you enjoyed the first rush, you'll probably enjoy this one as well, since the levels provide more of the same action, that is, if you're able to stomach the in-between sections, which I almost couldn't. Though that also means you're gonna have to sit through seven hours of Marines, so I changed my mind, zero out of ten. You know, we've been covering a lot of 2D Sonic games on the channel as of late, and I thought since we were on a roll, maybe it's time to check out another 2D Sonic game that people really seem to enjoy. So without further ado, we are checking out Sonic Colors for the- Uh, just because Sonic Colors has a lot of 2D sections doesn't make it a 2D game. This dude's a fraud, he's just trying to make people hate on the series. Why else would he call Sonic Advance 3 bad? <laughs> my mistake, I guess I made a comment preemptively, therefore making myself look foolish. Before we start today's episode, I just wanted to bring something to your attention. Don't worry, it is not a mobile game, I'm not shilling today. This is all about a video I uploaded earlier this week about my favorite thing in the entire world, or at least one of them, the Paper Mario series. I know it's not like the usual stuff I put up because it's always about Sonic and all that, but if you've been enjoying the videos I've been putting up lately because of the personality I display in my videos, please at least give it a chance, it would mean a lot to me. Thank you so much if you do, and without further delay, let's do this thing. God, if an elevator ride made me nauseous, maybe coming to a huge space amusement park wasn't such a good idea. I don't even like rides. I want off this crazy train! Alright, in the canon of this video, it makes absolutely no sense to start talking to the screen like this, but hello everyone, I'm Garilla64, and today I'm nipping this new comment trend in the bud, and we'll be checking out Sonic Colors for the Nintendo DS. To really immerse myself for this one, I went ahead and decided to drop myself into this madhouse to see what all the fuss was about. Kinda surprised that Dr. Eggman went and built this place to atone for his crimes, but whatever, he's a nice guy at heart, I guess. You might be wondering why I called this game something something Sonic Rush 3, I don't know the final title yet, and not just Sonic Colors DS. Well, for one thing, I refuse to let the spirit of Sonic Rush die, those reviews were some of my absolute favorites I've ever done, and second, Sonic Colors DS is literally just actually Rush 3. I mean, look at it. If you go back and watch either of the last two Rush reviews, the gameplay section describes how this game works almost perfectly. We once again have Sonic stuck to a 2D plane, which makes this game almost as much of a 2D game as the console version. What? Just because I made fun of that joke in the intro didn't mean I wasn't going to use it in the video. New to this version, though, is obviously the Wisps, this being their debut game. Almost every one of these critters makes a trip over from the Wii version, aside from the Jim! Wisp, which has been replaced with the far superior First! Wisp. The Fight. Wisp, which was replaced with nothing, and the Hover. Wisp, which was also replaced with nothing. Might be missing a few things here and there, but at least they didn't skip out on the cutscenes. Most of the essential cutscenes from the Wii version, including the intro, have been lovingly smashed to 192p for your viewing... pleasure? Sort of reminds me of that gif of the entire first Shrek movie, except a little bit more watchable. Any other scenes of dialogue are told using that slightly boring DS brand cutscene method with static portraits that change emotion based on what's being said. I was never a huge fan of this, but a DS game card can only hold so much stuff, and this game is hella nice looking, so I'm glad they didn't sacrifice gameplay for that. And just because I said I didn't like that style doesn't make me a hypocrite because I'm using it in this video. I'm trying to match the theme, it's called being creative, look it up. Now, one thing you might have noticed is the lack of... tricking. Sad to report that in this adventure, Dimps decided that enough was enough and removed it, which also removes one of the ways to build up the boost energy, thus making this game a lot less boost happy than the last two. The boost bar can now only be filled up by destroying enemies and collecting white wisp capsules, so to my horror, Dimps expects you to use your brain when trying to decide if you should hold down the boost button or not. I just have so little faith in my brain, I don't know if I can do this. 
Kind of weird that they did that though, considering that you can do tricks in the Wii version, and that's where the iconic <laughs> bit comes from. Like the Wii version, Sonic can't use the Wisp abilities from the start. He has to unlock them by visiting the theme park's various locales. In this version, Sonic doesn't even begin the game with the boost, which actually gives the Spin Dash some purpose in life, if only for a few short minutes. It actually makes a lot more sense than the Wii version, because you just begin that one by saving Wisps from capsules and machines and absorbing their power, and Sonic just kinda ignores it. I mean, judging by his reaction to harnessing their energy for the first time in the DS version, it's not exactly a subtle feeling. To be frank, the DS version just handles anything having to do with story a lot better than the Wii version. If you've played one or the other, you know the story. Sonic and Tails roll up to Eggman's newly built theme park, thinking he's doing something bad, and wow, crazy, he's actually doing something bad. Turns out, instead of just having one planet chained up this time, he's stolen five alien worlds from a race called the Wisps, and he's using them to steal energy to fuel his mind control cannon. The Wii version has a handful of animated cutscenes to get this point across, and also meme really hard with a lot of iconic lines. But the DS takes a simpler approach, which allows it to add more context to a lot of things. There are a handful of scenes where, for instance, Sonic and Tails are introduced to new Wisps by Yakker instead of them just appearing at levels randomly and not being talked about. They don't play off Yakker's leet speech thing as a huge plot point, so they have more time to get to the other important stuff. And perhaps my personal favorite, the amusement park isn't a ghost town, since as you'd expect, something this huge and mysterious appearing suddenly draws some attention. Almost every single member of Sonic's supporting cast has found their way into this game. Even Big the Cat figured out how to use the elevator, and he's once again searching for his frog, who I imagine activated the elevator for himself to try and escape from Big, because that's a hilarious visual. The modern Orbot and Cubot also make their first real appearance here, Orbot having solidified his appearance and personality after appearing as a sort of beta form of himself back in Sonic Unleashed. I wasn't a huge fan of these guys, funny enough, until the Sonic Boom cartoon rolled around, but now I can easily say that they're my favorite Eggman underlings, and they fit in perfectly with the likes of Scratch and Grounder and Deco and Boko. For those who enjoy the Sonic and Tails dynamic, for example from the Wii version, all of that is still going to be in this version, and since the friend stuff is relegated to side missions, you can get as much or as little of it as you want. The last huge difference between the Wii and DS versions comes in the form of the level structure. Instead of the game throwing, like, six acts of a zone at you, Colors DS sticks to the classic formula and gives you two stages and a boss fight. You might think that this makes it a lot shorter than the Wii version, but according to my own previous playthrough, the DS version only clocked in at around 4 hours and 30 minutes as opposed to 5 hours. Whether that be mostly because of the cutscenes or not, this game still feels like it has plenty going on, and honestly, less acts means the stages don't overstay their welcomes as much as they do in the Wii version. And before you misinterpret that, I'm not saying these stages are bad. I feel the exact opposite about them, in fact. These are some of the coolest stages we've had in the series up to this point. Seriously, when they do stuff like this or like in Sonic Heroes and get crazy colorful with everything, I just, I, I live for it. Starting out, we've got Tropical Resort, a stunning, vibrant paradise of a level filled with balloons, rails to grind, giant theme park signs, and giant totems that transport Sonic to new areas via questionable methods. I don't want to talk about it. You're really able to take in the sights of this one too, since you don't have the boost the first time you're dropped in here, and I can think of no better level in this game for taking one's time to enjoy the sights. And of course, do I even need to mention the soundtrack to this one? Of course it's good, it's a Sonic game. All the songs they brought over from the Wii version even have this nice little like classic-y feel to them too, because obviously the DS can't do the same kind of sound that the Wii does, so it just ends up sounding awesome. Once you've completed the first act, Sonic and Tails meet Yakker and the White Wisps, which allows Sonic to use the boost ability. From there, you're able to go back into the first level and re-explore, if you so desire, using your new power. The game does its best to remind you about this every so often, because occasionally you'll blow by a red ring that will be totally inaccessible without the Void Wisp, let's say. So of course, if you want 100% the game, you gotta go back, and sometimes maybe you're just forgetful, I don't know. I am. These are optional though, so I opted this time to just have fun instead of torturing myself looking high and low for them. I still actually have flashbacks to my generation's 100% run and... I will never do that again. After all, the Red Rings have nothing to do with Supersonic in this version of the game, so grabbing all 10 million of them seems like a waste of time. After completing an act, typically a bonus mission will appear, and that's where you find Sonic's friends. Tropical Resort, for instance, includes an encounter with... Janjo? You're not Cream the Rabbit. What a revelation! I'm glad you're able to tell the two of us apart. Now would you mind going to get me... Mm, 20 milkshakes? That's sort of an arbitrary number, but I'm on it. Alright, now what was he talking about? 
Cream the rabbit? Cream the rabbi? Oh, that can't be right. When you meet up with Sonic's friends in the park, they always end up sending him on a random mission due to the influence of Orbot or Cubot, or just to satiate the bloodlust. The levels these missions are focused in are usually the same ones you've already played in. The goals range from collecting 200 rings, destroying a ton of robots, or even trying to finish a stage in a lot of time limit while smashing capsules that will increase your limit! If you enjoyed the stages the first time though, it's a fun challenge to take on all the missions, but if you'd rather just get to the end of the game, there's no harm in skipping some of them. Alright, I'm back, and I think like half of these things melted on my way here, but mission accomplished! What's my reward? Ha, <laughs> nothing, dude. What? You're not even gonna pay me back for the milkshakes? That wouldn't really be in the spirit of Sonic Colors DS missions, now would it? That's really my one gripe with this game. There's a lot of extra content, and while it's nice to have the variety, you don't really get anything for it. I guess if you grind out the red rings, you do get the infinite boost, but other than that, it's just concept art, music, and the cutscenes in which you're either triumphant or humiliated in front of your friends. But to be fair, you can easily look up all of that on YouTube, which makes the side content there purely for the sake of 100% completion. What I assumed they were gonna do was tie the Chaos Emeralds to these missions, which might have been a bit better of an idea considering the way they chose to go about it this time. What do you mean? They don't seem like they're that much trouble. In fact, the game seemed to just let me play each special stage directly after Act 1 of each zone. Yeah, for six of them at least, but Dimps always has trouble keeping consistency with these things for some reason. Just watch. Turns out to access each special stage, all you need to do is reach the goal of 50 rings, just like Sonic 1. After that, the game gives you a courtesy screen that lets you get your stylus ready, and before you know it, you're running down a half pipe. Collect red spheres? <laughs> no, 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 that is all wrong. How could you expect me to go against the instincts you've been instilling in us since 1994? Ah, okay then. All is right with the world. Carry on. Now, personally, I hate the half-pipe stages and all the Sonic games. I think they're bad with their physics. I think they're bad with just how brutal they can be. But honestly, Sonic Colors DS is one of the better ones. Touch controls definitely, definitely help out a lot. These special stages actually harken back to Sonic Rushes, and when I first reviewed that game, I talked about how much I enjoyed them. The control here is just as precise, so there's no issue collecting every single sphere required of you, and more. Much, much more. These things are incredibly easy. I only came close to losing one time, and it was in the final special stage, but even so, I still cleared it by a good amount. I sorta of missed the challenge that special stages in Rush imposed, but retrying Rush is a lot easier than retrying in this game, so maybe that's for the best. Scratch that, actually. The entire game feels really easy, aside from some annoying isolated patches of weird level design. Eh, it's still really fun, though, so I, I guess I shouldn't complain too much. It's nothing game-breaking, after all. See? <laughs> that wasn't so bad. What was all the fuss about before? Have you counted your rocks there, pal? One, two, three, four, five, six... Hey, wait. Did they go all Game Gear Sonic on us and only add six emeralds? It's less than seven. Not quite. I told you Dimp's track record with these things is a little weird, but this one certainly takes the cake. Originally, I assumed the final emerald would be gained from Terminal Velocity, which isn't really a full zone, but it is a stage nonetheless. When I didn't find it there, I had to do some googling since I was at a loss, and it turns out all you gotta do is head over to the Sonic Simulator, go to Versus Mode, challenge the CPU to the first stage of Tropical Resort, and finish in first place with 50 rings. Of course, what was I thinking? That was so obvious. I can let Rush Adventure's weird mission-based Chaos Emerald system go, but what was the thought process here? Sonic Simulator is basically your hub for the multiplayer mode, options, and concept art. This is like hiding an easter egg in a gun safe. It's got no business being there, and why would anyone think to check in the first place? Well, at least we got them all. Can we talk about the other stages now? Yeah, let's wrap this up. Sweet. Mountain. Sweet Mountain is a level made up of all manners of food, ranging from burgers to bubblegum. Is bubblegum a food? The DS version of the game doesn't do an amazing job at making the stages stick out from each other in terms of actual level design, but the abundance of new wisp powers littering the levels makes up for that. 
The biggest gimmick here is the Burst Whip, which allows Sonic to float through the air and pop upwards after holding A, B, X, or Y. The button is held long enough, Sonic performs a screen nuke attack, sort of like Hypersonic used to do back in Sonic 3 and Knuckles. And if you want to watch a video about Hypersonic, we made one a little while ago, go check it out. Sweet Mountain also introduces these hot air balloons that slowly drift downwards. Sonic has to move left and right in these sections to avoid danger, unless he enters the balloon with a Burst Wisp active, in which case the balloon will rocket upwards. Ugh, that kind of reminds me of the hot air balloon sections in Yoshi's New Island. I'll never look at motion control the same way again after that game. Sweet Mountain also brings us the return of Blaze the Cat, who traversed dimensions to visit a theme park because she heard it was sweet, I guess? Sonic also pretends to care about how Marine's doing and... Yeah, I'm sure she's fine. Even better than that though, Silver makes an appearance, cementing this as the greatest Sonic Rush game out of all of them. He also insinuates that the future is brighter than literal Candyland, and my already terrible eyes are fearing for their lives. Next up, we've got Starlight Carnival, my favorite stage in the Wii version, and here it's just another stage. Sort of a shame that the light bridges seen in the Wii version of this stage are nowhere to be seen, and actually they only ever appear on the title screen of this game. That was like this level's defining characteristic in the Wii version, I thought that was like a big deal. This stage introduces the Rocket Wisp, which is exactly the same as the Wii version. The most interesting thing about this power-up is that if you use it in the boss fight, you can just melt it in a couple seconds, which is good because this one was actually kicking my butt a bit. All the boss fights in this game tend to have fun uses for the abilities you unlock, and it makes each fight pretty varied in terms of tactics, even if a few of them look similar to each other upon first glance. Suffice to say, this is not a, hey, let's fight the ferris wheel twice type deal. After Sonic returns from the dark vacuum of space, it's time to visit a green, lush paradise that just so happens to be the Wisp's homeworld, the very creatively named Planet Wisp. Both the industrial and natural side of the level provide fun gimmicks for the player to navigate, and we're introduced to the Drill Wisp. Using its power, Sonic can tunnel through soft ground or water, but if he gets caught underground when the power runs out, it's lights out. Literally. It's pretty dark underground, I hear. I liked the Drill Wisp a lot in the Wii version, but I can't stand it on the D-pad in this game. The thing is really frustrating to control, I kept bumping into walls all over the place, so I'm really glad outside of Planet Wisp it seems like it's largely optional. For instance, I'd much rather drown in Aquarium Park than be subjected to this any longer. Speaking of that level, Aquarium Park is an actual good water level. I was sort of freaking out when I played it, because the chances of finding a good water level is like the equivalent of finding a unicorn, i.e. not very likely. It also helps that in this stage, the Laser Wisp is unlocked, which allows Sonic to access a whole bunch of new pathways that zip him around lightning fast. It's also really satisfying to just blow through tons of robots, taking them out in the blink of an eye with this power-up. And I don't want to spend more time on the music, but... Yeah, Aquarium Park is one of the best songs in the entire series. But I'm open to suggestions in the comments if you have other favorites that aren't this one. Now that's what I'm talking about. No amusement park is complete without a roller coaster. Let's go. Uh, no, no, no. You, you go on ahead. I'll, I'll stay here and hold the chaos emeralds. Suit yourself. <laughs> Scaredy cat. <laughs> amusement park. For me, it's more like a bemusement park. Asteroid Coaster is a diabolical, I love that word, slime pit of a level complete with a roller coaster made out of what I hope aren't real bones. Eggman's looking more and more sadistic by the minute. Still not quite as bad as digging up people's bones, mixing them with tears, and then selling it back to people as a beverage like the Gluckens did in Oddworld. How'd you get up here so fast? I just cut the line, dude. Don't worry about it. It's fine. You're the real villain here. By this point, Dr. Eggman has been draining energy from Wisps and their planets long enough that some of them have been corrupted. Enter the Nega Wisps. These crazed little critters grant Sonic the Void ability, which transforms him into a chaotic mass of destruction that devours everything in its path, growing larger and larger than before, finally dropping Sonic back to the ground. This Wisp is actually kind of brutal, and weird to think about how much control Sonic really has over it. At the same time, 
Sonic can't save these worlds without tapping into this power, so perhaps it's a necessary evil. In other words, it's the Suck Wisp. That's a quicker way to describe it. Oh man, I think that was the bathroom. Am I gonna have to catch the elevator all the way back to Earth to find another one? <laughs> I think the bathroom is the least of your worries right now. Anyway, I think I'm gonna head out. Thanks for having me. Like, comment, subscribe, and all that. Hope you survive. <sighs> Final boss is time. First up, we've got the Nega Wisp armor, which follows immediately after this game's version of Terminal Velocity, which turns out to be a pretty unique top-down chase sequence. Instead of running towards the boss the whole time, like in Colors, Lost World, and Forces, Sonic waits atop a platform for Eggman to attack him with the very powers he's been using to thwart Eggman the entire time. As Sonic strikes the machine, his powers slowly return to him before he's able to do what Cell couldn't do back in Dragon Ball Z. And thus, the worlds are saved. Or so he thinks. I mean, if you don't have the Chaos Emeralds, then the world is totally saved. But if you do, there's more threats. We should really throw these things down a well, they're more trouble than they're worth. Yakker rushes to his friend's side in a panic, begging them to save his mother. The group then sees the titanic, corrupted wisp wreaking havoc nearby. So, guess what time it is. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Hey, you wanna hold these? My arms are getting a little tired. Oof. Yeah, alright, I know how they work. I'm not dyeing my hair blonde, though. It's just not gonna happen. Colors DS, unlike its Wii counterpart, actually includes a traditional supersonic fight for collecting all the Chaos Emeralds. Sonic charges at the Mother Wisp and knocks asteroids into it, which allows him to close in and strike her weak point. It's really not that hard, and it's basically just really time-consuming because you move really slowly, but it is not a bad fight. And with that remix of Reach for the Stars blur in the background, it's pretty cool. The Mother Wisp is then purified, and all's well that ends well. Everyone goes their separate ways, and that's Sonic Colors DS. Don't forget to also rock out to speak with your heart at the end of the game. It is such a good song and nobody ever talks about it. I didn't even know Colors had an ending song until I beat it on stream a couple years ago. A lot of people out there love this game to death, and I kind of do too. Like a lot of games I've played recently, it's got some weird stuff about it here and there, but most good games do, don't they? I can name a couple things out of my favorite games of all time that I just straight up hate. But just because there are some things you don't like doesn't mean you can't enjoy the thing as a whole. I don't think I'd rank this one above Rush or Rush Adventure in terms of levels, but I'd definitely replay this game before I ever play Rush Adventure again because of how tedious that was. All in all, if you're a fan of the Wii version and you're looking for something that expands upon what it tried to do, I'd say check this one out. That also goes for Rush fans, since this is basically Rush 3, and eventually we'll even take a look at Rush 4 as well. Now, any last words before we end it off? Okay, yeah, we, we could have stopped before the alien called Sonic hot. I would have been just fine with that. <laughs>